Welcome everybody to the June 17th, uh, 2022 Trail Water Land Alliance meeting. It's great to see everyone virtually. Uh, we were just talking earlier about uh, maybe having an in-person meeting coming up in October. So maybe we'll talk more a little about that later, uh, but we're really, really glad to have you here today. And we've got three wonderful topics um, that you uh, will enjoy this morning. Um, as Kristen said, we'll take questions after each one um, and then uh, put them in the chat. Uh, Ryan's going to be monitoring the chat box and also uh, updates. If you've got them, we'll put them in the chat box near the end and make sure it gets distributed. So um, I will turn it back over to Kristen right now if there's any uh, information or updates that need to be uh, told before we start. Or are we good? No, I think we're all set. We can get going. Wonderful. Um, our first topic this morning is Rochester Hills Green Space Advisory Board and Program Update. We've got Matt Einhauser, uh, Rochester Hills Natural Resources Manager. And uh, welcome, Matt. It's great to see you. Thank you for having me. Start sharing my screen here. Can everyone see my slides? All right. So thanks again for having me. Uh, Matt Einhauser, I'm the Natural Resources Manager for the city of Rochester Hills. Uh, I've been with the city now for four or five years. And one of my duties as the natural resources manager is overseeing our green space program and being the staff uh, liaison or contact for our green space advisory board. Um, so I'll get right into it. Uh, background on our green space program in general. So I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. Uh, when I talk about knowing the benefits of green spaces and our parks and trails and having that connection to the outdoors for residents, uh, we know there's health benefits, both physically, mentally, uh, the economic benefits with um, uh, home prices, close by green spaces, recreational values, and then the obvious environmental and ecological benefits that come with green spaces. So. Uh, residents of Rochester Hills acknowledged this back in 2005 and, and saw value in this and passed a millage, a 10 year millage uh, to develop and establish a green space fund so that the city could purchase properties for permanent preservation of the natural features on those properties uh, to protect the woodlands or wetlands or streams and expand uh, in general our trail corridors and green spaces. So with that, a uh, green space advisory board was developed um, and appointed through city council, a nine member board that would evaluate properties uh, for purchase. Um, and early on, largely it was for the evaluation of properties and to uh, provide recommendations to city council on how to uh, spend those green space funds. Over time, as nominated properties slowed down and that initial surge of property purchases were made, uh, they started to realize, okay, we need to start to manage these properties and be stewards of these properties and improve them. And so in 2013, there was uh, a ballot vote uh, to revise the language and allow revenues or interest from the Green Space Trust Fund to be used for stewardship and improved access. So that's kind of where we are now and, and, and some background on, on our Green Space program. So overall, we have eight Green Space parcels. On the map, you can see those are the bright green ones that I show. Uh, the light green ones are our parks. Um, our green space is total over 138 acres. So as you can imagine in Rochester Hills, we're not talking about 100 acre parcels. Uh, got quite a bit of development here. And so we're talking parcels that range from two acres along our river to 48 acres, which is our largest one. Uh, these were obtained through purchases primarily, but we do have some instances where land was donated to the city. Um, it's important to point out uh, that our green spaces are not parks. So in general, <clears throat> um, green spaces being purchased through the millage have specific limitations of what can and cannot be done 
on those properties. So, to, uh, you know, playgrounds, playscapes, parking lots, none of that can be done on our green spaces. They're for passive recreation, uh, for the most part, natural dirt paths. Um, and the primary purpose is preservation. Um, so we always kind of have this uh, conundrum or, or there's a fine balance of promoting and getting people outdoors in these spaces and wanting people to connect and use them. But at the same time, um, we have our parks where they can bring their dogs, where if they want to bike, they can bike. And so uh, with our ordinance, you know, pets aren't allowed, bikes aren't allowed because we want to preserve the wildlife and the natural creatures in those spaces. So we have a diverse uh, habitats and different types of spaces and, and uh, characteristics to each um, property. I just wanted to highlight a couple, couple of them, four of them. The first one is our Harding Green Space. This is a 27 acre parcel and it's probably our most used or visited green space because it's right along the Clinton River Trail there, um, east of Livernois, kind of by Rochester University. Um, it's a mix of native prairies, upland forests, and there's a pond on site, an old uh, pine grove. So it's, it's quite a uh, unique and high quality space, uh, but it has needed some attention for woody invasives uh, and different invasives like we see on a lot of our, our properties. Uh, the next one that I have on this slide is the Ruby Green Space. This one's a little bit different because it's not connected along a corridor like a trail or the river. It's kind of amongst subdivisions, which makes it unique. Uh, it was, there was an old homestead that we demolished on site, turned into a native prairie, and there's some really awesome ephemeral wetlands in the forested area. And this one actually gets used quite a bit by the subdivisions. And it's in an area of the city that we didn't have a lot of parks and green space for people to enjoy. So it ranked really high because of those reasons. Innovation Hills Green Space is another one I wanted to point out. It's our largest uh, 48 acre um, property. It's my favorite. It's got tamarack swamps, some great wet meadows, rolling upland uh, woodlands. It's just a really cool property on the north side of the river from our newest park, Innovation Hills. Um, and so that one's got a little bit tough access. However, there are some plans to put a rope bridge across from the park so park uh, people enjoying the park can get across the river and see more, a more natural um, side of, of the park and experience the, the natural paths versus the more developed park on the south side. And then the Auburn Green Space, this one we just purchased earlier this year. Uh, it's heavily invaded by invasive species. Uh, so we're not in a huge rush to get in there because nothing's going to really get worse. However, it's got some really awesome potential because it's a nice big um, emergent marsh. Once we get in there and, and put some efforts and restoration towards it, it should be a really cool different type of green space that we have um, in the southeast or southwest portion of the city. Um, so we're excited about that. So I mentioned stewardship and our ability to use the interest and green space funds to do stewardship. So in 2015, we uh, the first thing we did was develop a long-term uh, management plan with our, our stewardship contractor. And then year to year, we go through and we kind of prioritize projects. Myself as the manager and our naturalist uh, work with um, our contractors to develop a plan for the year. Our green space advisory board uh, uses that to make their budget recommendations to city council. And then we attack uh, the primarily invasives on, on the property. Uh, early on, this was really targeted approach to the high quality areas, the, the ones that we want to get to right away before they became a real big issue. Now we're really attacking the areas that have been heavily impacted and doing uh, some using more aggressive approaches like forestry mowers, um, and things like that. And then uh, a lot of those areas that we've gotten into what we're calling like a maintenance mode, um, we are doing continual management techniques. So prescribed burning and just follow up treatments. Um, in a lot of areas we've 
turn from complete buckthorn and honeysuckle thickets um, to some really high quality open forested areas. And it's really cool to start to see that stuff uh, play out. In addition to stewardship, our Green Space Advisory Board to put a lot of emphasis on outreach. It's funny, um, a lot of our residents don't even know these green spaces exist. And like I said, it's kind of a balance. We don't want a ton of people going out to these spots. We want these to be preserved. These aren't our parks. We have our parks that people can get out and, and do a lot of their more outreach. So these are areas we'd like people to be a little bit more uh, passive in. But at the same time, we do really value people getting connected. And these are public spaces, and we want people to know about them. So we do volunteer uh, stewardship out on these sites. We do hikes. Uh, obviously trash and debris cleanups and um, try to try to get people in touch with with these spaces. Looking forward um, with our green space program and, and where we're at kind of starting this year is obviously continual stewardship. Uh, we're looking to do to develop a more um, stronger monitoring program and kind of reevaluate that initial long-term plan that we put together now six years old. All right, where are we at? How have, how has our efforts uh, done over the years? Uh, obviously we wanna expand on some of those highly impacted areas and continue to do stewardship there uh, and on the new spaces that we continue to uh, purchase. Um, as we get things more into maintenance mode, we're looking more towards uh, larger projects like stream bank restoration projects on some of our green spaces. As you saw, many of them border our river. That always makes it a higher ranking property when we're making those recommendations. And so in a lot of those cases, like we see along the Clinton River, there's active erosion and, and stream bank issues. So we're always looking at the possibilities of doing uh, river projects. And then as always, we're taking, uh, we're always looking at nominated properties and uh, where we can expand on our green spaces. So we recently took a step back and looked at what properties are still available. There's not a ton left to purchase and they're gonna be smaller pieces here and there, um, but we did some active outreach to those properties, sending letters, uh, letting them know, you know, this program exists for if they're ever looking to sell or donate or anything like that. So, um, that's kind of where we're at. These are some awesome pictures that we've gotten over the last couple of years on our green spaces. These have all been taken um, on those properties by residents or staff. So uh, some great birds utilizing the sites. And as you can imagine, white-tailed deer, surprise, surprise. There's white-tailed deer in Rochester Hills and Elgin County, um, but they, they love our green spaces, so. With that, uh, thanks again, and I'll answer any questions people might have. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but uh, I do. I do have a, a question for you. Um, as far as you mentioned, <clears throat> you have property, uh, some remaining property left in the in the community that you could and you've done some outreach too. How did you go about prioritizing, identifying that property? So um, I'm gonna go back to this slide really quick. Uh, we initially based a lot of our rankings off of the natural features inventory that we had done for the community. We're updating that right now. But we go back to that and we have priority, uh, a prioritization a lot of that, once again, is connected to, is it part of the county green infrastructure plan and greenway and river and trails? And all of that kind of ranks out. And once we have that, we look at areas that are above you know, two acres and are either vacant or maybe there's an old home on them. And those were the areas that we kind of targeted. And once, if somebody nominates their property, so it's gotta be nominated obviously by the landowner and they would not have to be interested in you know, seeing if the city is interested. Uh, once they nominate it, the Green Space Advisory Board will go and visit the site. We have a scoring sheet or a ranking sheet that we go through and say, okay, what's the percentage woodlands, percentage wetlands? Is it connected to a trail? Uh, all these different questions. And then we get a score for that. 
early yeah. on that score was extremely valuable when you're looking at multiple properties. Um, nowadays, when they're trickling in and we only get maybe one or two properties a year, the score is a little bit kind of less valuable because we're willing to almost, you know, look and, and talk and be at the table for anything that meets some of those basic criteria, so. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a question now in the chat. Uh, has there ever been any thought connecting Bloomer to River Bends across 23 Mile into Quinder via bike trail? So there's a lot of improvements going on over there right now that's going to improve the pathway along the road. There used to be a bridge connecting Bloomer to Yates Park at one point that was removed because it was constant issues and upkeep. And I don't believe there's any plans at this point for the city to, to reestablish a bridge there from Bloomer. But I, I do think the road improvements, there's gonna be some roundabouts right there to help the traffic. They widen that bridge. So there's some big pathways on both sides of the bridge now. And I, I believe there's a bike trail um, to the west of the river that you'll be able to connect there and then kind of get by Yates Cider Mill and that should help with that connection. Okay, great. And uh, one more uh, from Kathleen says, hi, Matt, thank you for your awesome work. Hello. Do, you <laughs> do you collaborate with partners in the area like the trail and the university? Um, what was the first one? Uh, do you cl collaborate with partners in the area like the trail and the university. Yeah, so, so maybe. Yeah, ahead. we we are always uh, part of natural resources outdoor engagement. So we have a naturalist and interpreter that puts on programs. So we're always partnering with people on programming. Uh, trails wise, we have partnered in the past with a uh, Sisma um, work on invasives along the Clinton River Trail, putting in an application with their grant system, um, and. Uh, we do we do a lot of the maintenance along the trails that run through our city. So yeah, we're always looking to partner. The university uh, we partner on a ton of things. I'm trying to think of specific um, programs. Um, not so much Rochester University. We just recently helped them with some river restoration type stuff right behind their buildings, and we're always in communication with them. So. Yeah, we're, we're always at the table to help. Okay, great, thanks. Um, we, we do have one more question. Uh, uh, I guess we'll answer it real quick. Are you qualifying uh, or quantifying your green spaces as part of greater sustainability plan for the city? Um, to, I guess I don't fully understand what the, that question is asking, but um, it is. I get, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I, I, quantifying your green spaces is part of the sustainability plan. So I guess is it are they included in some way in the, in the sustainability plan? Um, they are planning uh, department, and then also in our parks master plan and department master plan and comprehensive plans, we are always taking green spaces into consideration, and it's a big uh, effort. We have a lot of res residents, as much as I said, some residents still don't know about our green spaces. There is a huge, obviously with the passage of the millage, um, there's huge support for the green space program. And we get a lot of residents that come out and support when a, a property is nominated and things. So yeah, it's a great value and still really very active program in our city's uh, different plans and looking into the future. Great, thank you, Matt. Yep. All right. Um, thank you very much, Matt. And thank you for the great questions. Um, the next topic is the Southfield City Center Trail with Terry Crowe, City of Southfield Director of Planning. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, I believe I uh, made a presentation five or six years ago when we were starting our journey. Again, my name is Terry Crow, Director of Planning. I've been the Planning Director since August of 2010. I'd like to introduce two team new planning team members, Suzanne Hanna, our new Sustainability Planner, and Ross Quero, Planner One, who are joining us today. 
And uh, I believe we were scheduled to host one of these meetings and do a walking tour, but was uh, first casualty of COVID-19. So I'm glad to be back to give you guys an update. For those who don't know Southfield, we're a population of about 78,000. They, they grew to 175,000 pre-COVID. Uh, we were incorporated in 1958, but we were the fastest growing community in the 1960s. And we were developed with a very auto-dominated land use pattern. We, uh, 60 years later, um, we, we are still dealing with that uh, auto-dominated land use pattern. But we've used the city center, which was established in 1992 as a principal shopping district, as a catalyst for developing trails in, in our urban environment. Today, we have 10,000 square feet of non-residential use, representing about 1.76 square miles. We have a special assessment district that collects five cents per square foot of non-residential. It gives us about uh, just over a half a million dollars each year for capital improvements. And uh, looking back at 2010, when I started, we had significant gaps in our pedestrian system, a number of disconnected five foot sidewalks with little or no pedestrian amenities, seas of asphalt that were created by requiring all buildings to be 75 foot uh, set back from the road. And the red indicates uh, all the significant gaps in our city center when I first took over. Uh, our first major project was the redevelopment of Evergreen Road through an enhancement grant, working with SEMCOG and MDOT. And we took set six to seven uh, lanes uh, and created a pedestrian um, pathway 10 feet wide, uh, landscape median, uh, roundabouts, uh, mid-block crossing. And this really um, signaled the, the, the shift in um, moving from auto-dominated to pedestrian focus in our community. Um, one of the other uh, first projects, we, we created a three and a half, uh, a, a loop, 10 foot wide loop um, trail in front of City Hall, three and a third times around equals a mile. And people started getting out and engaging with each other, walking this loop. Then it was connected to our one mile long new pathway along Evergreen, providing heart healthy activity and giving us and our residents and visitors the opportunity for nature bathing. These are just some uh, of the pedestrian amenities that were layered on this first urban trail. And then we started focusing along Northwestern Highway. Again, we had significant gaps, what I call goat pass. We don't have a natural river or former railroad corridor, uh, rails to trails. Oh, we had is a uh, highway, but we felt that this was a significant spine that um, could be developed connecting our various businesses, Lawrence Tech University to the city center. And you can see 2010 um, were significant areas that we identified. And in 220, um, we've made a lot of progress on our pathway system. Uh, our site analysis showed that um, it was a hostile environment. We had vehicles going 45 to 60 miles an hour, a busy highway with 110,000 trips per day and significant gaps in our pedestrian network. Uh, we came up with a concept plan um, for the pathway to start as an impetus for redevelopment of North, Northwestern Highway, which we've branded the city center trail. And here are some before and after pictures uh, that gives you an idea of the goat pass that many pedestrians and students were accessing along Northwestern Highway Service Drive. Again, another before and after picture. And uh, we felt that since uh, this was a new bold trail system that was not really um, known by all the motorists traveling along Northwestern Highway, we needed a significant gateway project which led to the development of Red Pole Park. We developed the five-year wayfinding master plan once the trail was developed. These are some of our significant um, prototypes of signs developed along the trail. And last year, we had um, enough linkage and connectivity. Uh, I was proud that we were able to start establishing 
quarter mile trail markers that are color coded based on the orientation of travel. We've also um, Red Pole Park and our trail system, there's a, a natural 3.1 mile um, circular loop. We have a half a dozen organizations, including the Crohn's and Colitis Walk that was just here last weekend, that love our wide pathways, that like the um, pedestrian amenities, the ample parking at City Hall, and uh, our signage in, in art. Um, so we've become a, a venue for many fundraising, um, community events along our trail system. Our, our uh, next focus, what we call the middle section back in, in 2021, was the uh, half mile, three quarters of a mile stretch adjacent to Lawrence Tech University. Again, Lawrence Tech was first established as a commuter school, but now it has over a thousand resident uh, students living on campus. It has over 26 uh, varsity sports teams. So those students are coming in during the summer and living year round but they had no uh, sidewalk or pathway adjacent to their, their, their main frontage on Northwestern side highway. So in 2021, we, uh, with the assistance again, with another uh, MDOT SEMCOC grant partnerships with Lawrence Tech and the city center, we developed another three fifths of, of a mile walking path with a beautiful skyline of town center on the left. And um, the students have embraced that, especially the athletes for uh, social walking. We see a number of employees and faculty using it and athletes training along our trail system. Um, we've also beefed up our uh, facilities supporting bike, biking and bike share. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well as connecting our public transit system to our, our trail. With a little bit of whimsy, I want to keep things fresh and exciting for uh, walkers all the time along our trail. We have 18 unique birdhouses, and last year we installed uh, five bat houses along our trail system. And we hope to have some type of geocaching event in the future. And then recently this year, uh, we installed three dog treat stations, and they've been very popular with our, our dog walkers. Always, uh, we wanna build ownership over our trails through understanding becomes appreciation and through appreciation becomes stewardship. We're very proud that we have six to eight interpretive panels talking about our art, talking about our environment uh, and talking about Southfield's history. We've tried to reclaim some overgrown detention retention ponds and restore them and create a series of outdoor rooms and support that with some whimsical art. And uh, here's an example of um, some reclaimed space. We also um, are very proud to be working on our fifth edition of our city center trail map and brochure where we highlight significant historical sites, art and community events throughout the city. And each year we've been able to add additional mileage to our trail system. We are currently at 7.75 linear miles and we have another mile and a half uh, under construction in various segments of the city. Um, as I, I indicated, if you're driving southbound on Northwestern Highway from Lawser to Civic Center, this is the last stretch of, of road frontage in the entire district that was a goat path. Uh, it currently is under construction I've been told that this weekend they'll be putting the first coat of paving on here. And by um, summer, we should be able to open this up to the public. We also are extending our trail system southbound from Nine Mile to Cornell and eventually linking the city center to our downtown development district, Lawrence Tech to Ascension Providence Hospital and our, our trail system to um, the new redevelopment at Northland Mall, where we hope to have a mile and a half perimeter pathway uh, around that development as well. We've made substantial improvements in art. I believe we've installed over 21 pieces with a couple still under construction. These are some recent installations from last year. Uh, we're working with Dr. Hubert Massey on a community inspired mosaic that tells the history of Southfield. Um, he's finishing up uh, six panels 
Uh, matter of fact, he, he started uh, back out there this, this past week. And um, the inspiration came from two virtual town hall meetings that represent the history, culture, uh, environment, and future of Southfield. So if you get a chance, go check that out. Uh, we also know how important it is to celebrate success. So after two years of being cooped up with COVID, last September, we held an in-person event. I was very excited that we were able to secure Lawrence Tech's marching band. And we did a ribbon cutting, had some speeches, and then marched the uh, three-fifths of a mile down to the stadium to celebrate the opening of this latest section of trail. I mentioned that we've had a bike share program with two different providers. One did not survive COVID, so we scrambled and, and got a new provider. Uh, we currently have nine stations and over 30 bikes. We've had as many as 11 stations. 50% of all ridership comes from Lawrence Tech University. But utilizing heat map, we see that um, people are using these bikes and in, in extending as far as Tell 12, uh, 12 miles Southfield and other parts of the city. And uh, last year we also launched a pocket uh, sites tour. We have one specifically on art and another one that includes art, culture, and history. It's a 3.1 mile loop. Um, you can walk it or you can do it virtually, but it gives in-depth background on the historic sites and pieces of art in our uh, circular tour which has been very popular. Um, the trail has also led um, to significant economic development. And uh, we're very proud that we had a, some small part in uh, this impetus of economic development. We have two hotels under construction. The ownership specifically said that Red Pole Park was the reason that they looked at the site. It's a destination, it's a visible icon and they're proud to be building um, their hotels adjacent to Red Bull Park and being able to link into the trail system. So with that, if you could just permit me a minute or two, I'd just like to read a, a few closing remarks to summarize my presentation. From the Great Recession to COVID-19, we have learned to be fluid while achieving our goal of being a more walkable and pedestrian friendly community. The city center trail is more than just getting from point A to B. It is the thread that links public transportation hubs with municipal buildings, a university, a library, businesses, retail and dining, accessible to non-motorized traffic through extra wide shared use pathways. Much like a lighthouse signals landfall to traveling vessels, Red Pole Park serves as a modern beacon along the trail. The photo shows blue solar powered marine navigation lights that come on every night and blink like fireflies. The Southfield City Center Trail is a new urban greenway that brings community desired walkability to a sub suburb once hostile to any form of transportation other than the personally owned vehicle. Situated along a major urban freeway, the trail is now a welcoming venture for heart healthy activity and provides opportunities for human to human and human to nature interactions. Forming the backbone for additional trail development, Southfield City Center Trail has spurred economic development and promotes civic engagement through community building events in a space where people feel safe and welcome. Carved away from years of suburban indifference towards the needs of pedestrians, this trail provides space and access for diverse individuals to connect and collaborate. Much like a river ebbs and flows providing life to all in its path, the city center Greenway Trail is a primary channel from which other tributaries have sprouted to provide healthy outdoor access that was missing from this urban environment. By taking a 10 minute walk, individuals in 10 million square feet of office and high density mixed use space can reap the physical and mental health benefits of nature bathing, a form of ecotherapy that can reduce stress, increase attention and enhance creativity. The Greenway Trail provides more than 30,000 office workers, residents, students, and visitors the chance to engage with nature year round on accessible half mile loop paths that wind through outdoor rooms. In the past year and a half, we have seen a renewed interest in walking in a safe and socially distant environment due to COVID-19. Users of the trail can educate themselves about the value 
of urban wildlife and plant amenities and environmental sustainability through interpretive panels placed along the route, a resource that enhances knowledge and therefore stewardship of outdoor resources. Encouraging you can signage provides positive messaging for people on the trail. It is within the public realm that we can have the greatest impact on daily lives where people of all abilities, incomes and backgrounds can meet, gather and enjoy the out of doors. The trail system addresses the legacy of inequity by promoting walkability and equal access from the non-motorized movement. In addition, we see the city center trail fundamentally provides for social equity and inclusion by giving lower income populations and persons with disability the ability to safely travel to nearby work centers, educational opportunities, and health facilities. In closing, the city center trail system with its wide shared use pathways, coordinated benches, and trash receptacles, attractive and accessible wayfinding, bicycle fix-it stations, art, whimsical birdhouses, interpretive panels, and numerous other pedestrian amenities has transformed a highly vehicle-centric corridor into a safe and welcoming place for non-motorized traffic. Thank you for letting us share our story. Great, thank you very much, Terry. I just wanna say it's amazing the transformation that's taken place in such a car dominated area to provide all the amenities, especially to the students at, at uh, Lawrence Tech and, and to bring people into the, the communities. It's really amazing what's, what's taken place. So with that said, we do have a couple questions in the chat. Uh, first from John Hensler, fantastic, Terry. Uh, for the dog treat dispensers, how often do you, uh, have to refill those. Do you have doggy waste bag dispensers? Uh, so um, we check the stations weekly and we'll, we'll, we'll fill them as needed. And um, it was interesting. We, when we first put them up, we got some buzz on Instagram. We actually had someone calling who was concerned about the ingredients, didn't think about that because of uh, allergies. So we uh, posted the ingredients on the inside of the box. And we just uh, received our dog waste stations uh, two days ago. So they'll be uh, installed in the near future. But um, yes, we did think about that. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, has, there, has there been any interest in partnerships from other student hubs outside of the district, such as Specs Howard or any of the satellite campuses of OCC or CMU, Spring Arbor? Well, um, one, one of our, our goals, uh, as I said, is um, connecting the city center to the DDA, which would um, connect uh, OCC to our trail system. We are working with an, a number of our neighboring uh, communities on Nine Mile Corridor and developing that as a trail and greenway. I mean, there's, a, there's an ambitious goal to connect I-75 to 275. We've had a couple very informal meetings with uh, city managers. But as we complete our Northwestern Highway, we will be connecting into Nine Mile, which then uh, will connect to OCC. Specs Howard has closed or relocated and Lawrence Tech, I believe is taking over that space. So yeah. we, are, we, are, we are working strategically on extending our, our, our pathway system to those um, educational hubs, medical hubs and employment centers. Uh, and I was very happy that the council supported using Metro funds an additional mile uh, uh, in two half mile segments that will be under construction this fall. And the city center was sponsored that half a mile along Wasser. And recently, Senator Moss, um, through some state funding, uh, secured some additional funding for more trails. So we're, we're well funded right now, and we continue to build this, not using general funds matching grants and um, private public partnerships. Excellent. Um, how about for the trail? Um, this question is, uh, do uh, local schools use the trail network that you've established? Well, uh, a def we definitely see um, the university using uh, the trails. Um, they have uh, still some off-campus housing. Uh, where we've seen a huge uptick is the employers using morning and afternoon for walks and jogs, and the residents are benefiting from the trail system in the evenings and weekends. So we're definitely seeing a lot more um, 
pedestrian and biking activity. Uh, Southfield has a slow roll every Thursday night. I believe there's up to between 150 and 175 bikers that go out. Um, this was just a, a grassroots effort that, that developed. They're independent from what we're doing, but they're utilizing parts of the trail as well. Thanks. And one final question. Uh, Fred Phillips is wondering, is there still a nature area behind Civic Center buildings? Yes. Um, and, and does it link to the trails? Well, it, it, it links to the trails via the campus um, being linked to that. And we uh, submitted recently for a RAP grant uh, for uh, take advantage of some of the MEDC money on placemaking and revitalizing the business. And we have some ambitious goals of further developing our front lawn loop and making it more accessible and tie in with some mixed use development that's scheduled to take place across the street from City Hall. So eventually um, we'll, we'll be increasing our accessibility throughout the entire campus. Okay, thank, once again, thank you very much, Terry, for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful things going on in Southfield. Thank you so much. Um, our next topic is the Clinton River Area Mountain Bike Association Bike Patrol with Vito Manzella, the Cramba NSP Bike Patrol Director. Uh, welcome, Vito. Well, thanks for having me. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so as Kristen said, I'm, I'm Vito Manzella, and uh, she, I believe, sent out a uh, brochure that we use for recruiting, but I've gone ahead and uh, created like a little uh, PowerPoint presentation that will uh, better explain what we are and you know how we operate and you know how we're structured so i'm gonna go ahead and launch that uh let me make sure so all right so do you guys see my screen yep okay good okay so um i you know we're the national mountain bike patrol uh the crama division okay so it's a it's a group of patrols across the country um crama is a chapter uh which is a lo local group of biking enthusiasts that were a division of imba which helps us by supporting us with trail design and and just uh blueprints and, and a lot of the things that uh you know cost a lot of money and we don't have the resources for locally so it gives us a good professional built trail system um, we do mainly, uh, we started out mainly with mountain biking, but we've, uh, gone into just basically bike, the biking community. So we also do gravel rides, um, you know, road rides, rail to trail rides. So, uh, our group reports directly up into Cramba and, oops, hang on. Okay. So, and, and, you know, again, Cramba, this is a group of, uh, guys on a trail day. Um, they came out there with shovels and, and basically just, uh, they changed this berm right here. Um, so, uh, we, uh, we existed to help develop really a biking system in Southeastern Michigan. And we support other chapters that are part of them, but too, um, with some of our resources too. Um, the history of it is, is it started in 1994, uh, Imba created it and, uh, the Cramba division started probably in the late 90s and uh you know we were part of Imba. we utilized them for the design support but they also had a a medical uh, uh it was basically the american red cross uh you know in field uh basic first care but uh, in 2018 Imba lost the funding from their main sponsor and the ski patrol stepped up and uh, we've taken that over and, and mainly the ski patrol is our medical division so uh, i'll cover in a second you know the, the level of care that we offer but um you know I, i've been a ski patroller for 19 years so i was kind of asked to step up and bridge the two organizations together um so our cramba bike patrol uh we're currently at 68 members you know just some stats from last year we, uh, we had 60,000 rider contacts. And, and what that means is that we determined that, you know, each individual person, when you add up the sum total, we had 60,000 different point of contacts from other riders and people uh, seeing our branded jerseys. Um, you know, 2,000 hours of riding actually. And uh, 
uh, you know, we, so so we're getting we're getting the name out there. But uh, we're all volunteers. Um, we we're actually a five hundred one c three, so it's nonprofit. Uh, we are dual five hundred one c three once through the NSP, the National Ski Patrol, and then once through Cranbo as a local chapter. Okay, and what we do is we we provide mainly medical first response um, assistance, but we also uh, can assist in repairs too, and we you know, we work with land managers too. So um, our mission is, uh, you know, training. We, we assist, we assist people in mechanical and medical. We educate the trail users for proper etiquette. We educate each other. Uh, we teach internally. So we, you know, we have a group of uh, accredited, uh, what's called outdoor emergency care um, qualified instructors. I'm, I'm one. We, we do in-house CPR to for. Uh, the members, um, and uh, you know, we just make sure that our our accreditation is updated each year, and then we also our eyes and ears of the land managers and trail users. Um, so if we see something, we report it up. So we got our contact list of uh, you know the, the trails we ride. Um, our vision is is uh, we want to provide exceptional service to the public. Um, you know, get out, have a good time. We, uh, we're striving to grow the patrol. Uh, currently, we're the uh, second largest national ski patrol, bike patrol in the country. Um, we're, like I said, we're at 68, 69 members right now, and we're continuing to grow. We just added, uh, we, we, we took 10 of our members and created a second NSP bike patrol for Motor City Mountain Bike Patrol, which is further, further west than what we use as our hub, but it's part, Oakland County is part in there too. Um, so this is how we're structured. So this is us, the National Mountain Bike Patrol, and you can see our logo there in the NSP. Um, so we report up into the National Ski Patrol. We utilize them for our education and medical knowledge in, in a lot of our um, national structure. And then uh, we report up in the Cranla, which is you know has their own board, and I, I'm a member of that board. Um, so, you know, our main purpose in Cranba is to take the trails that we help support, uh, educate people on how to, you know, how to use the trails, um, design, create. We, we just put a lot of money into uh, Stony Creek um, and redesigned it as a free flow trail, which uh, some people love, some people don't like, um, but you never make everybody happy. Um, so this is how we, you know, this is how my my team is structured. So um, that's me right there, the patrol director. So I've uh, I, you know also part of my board is a, a previous patrol director. We elect a, a member at large to represent the membership, and then I appointed four uh, assistant patrol directors. And you know pretty much through you know serving, we serve the public and we serve the board. This is how we govern, and then we report up. Um, you know, into, like I said, into Crane by and to the NSP. Okay, so this, this is myself. Um, I appointed uh, somebody for membership, somebody for medical training. Um, OFC stands for Outdoor First Care. And, and, and then uh, Wayne is my uh, on-trail training to help improve our skills. And then Brad, uh, his, his goal is to partner us up with, with uh, good caused um, events you know, a lot of people look at bikers and they see a bunch of drunken people that don't know how to share the road. Um, you know, that's not the that's not the look that we want while we're wearing this cross. So we're we're looking to partner up with. You know, we, we've done some events for the ride and suicide. Um, you know, we do a lot of events with Mishka, which is a Michigan International Michigan Scholastic uh, School Association, but it's it's a very good organized group that gets kids out using, you know, instead of playing video games indoors, they're out there riding bikes and, and getting good at it. So our, just the basic expectations is uh, everyone has to patrol 20 hours a year, which most people go way over that. Um, you know, last year I did 200 uh, hours. Uh, my highest guy did 350. Um, I tend to minimum of one mountain bike race. Again, if you're involved, you're gonna be doing five or six of those. Uh, Make sure that your uh, accreditation for your medical skills is up to date. So, you know, we keep a log of everyone's training. So the OEC 
is the ski patrol's version of a basic EMT course. And it's uh, when you first go through it, it's a 12 week commitment that uh, you, you walk away and you understand how to be an EMT on the ski slopes. Um, and then the OFC is basic first aid through the ski patrol, which is just a modified version of this. And this, this expectation is about 12 hours. Um, and then all, everyone has to take CPR. So again, we teach it internally to try to make things easier for us. Um, you got to maintain your membership due. So that's where the biggest cost comes in. There's an associated cost to each member for NSP. And there's another one back up into Cranba Imba. Maintain your equipment and your bike. And then wear the jersey, which is you know, gentleman's help and the lady at the, with the wrist injury. Um, I, I just explained this, but the o, OEC is a, is a stepped up version. Um, it's, it's a mobile EMT, first year EMT course. And it's, it's a, the book's about uh, you know, two and a half inches thick, and it, it covers everything. Um, and then it, outdoor force care is, is basic first care. So our responsibilities, we represent. We represent the bike patrol and NSB in a professional manner. Um, you, know, you don't want to be drinking while wearing this jersey. Uh, we assist injured, so we have a duty to perform, but uh, we're, we're protected under the Good Samaritan Act, um, as long as we have, you perform within your, your uh, training. We also complete incident reports, which uh, event organizers appreciate because it gives them, uh, you know, if, it, if you don't document it, it didn't happen, is how we look at it. So we try to document everything that's, that's serious. Uh, we interact with trail users a lot of times we're just giving directions or you know, people see the jersey and want to have a conversation with us uh, we educate trail users on, on you know hey that was kind of a risky move you did there you might want to notify you know, when you're passing me on the left uh, and then we reset reassist in basic repairs so if, if somebody's out in the middle of the woods and they get a flat tire and we're able to get them going with the patch kit um it, 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 you know where do i donate that's what they ask usually um, so this, this is the incident report we use. So we mainly use this, we, we, you know, we keep one in our bag, but we'll use this for events, um, like the Turdy Trite, you know, we had a, a lady, um, um, you know, she broke her humerus and, uh, you know, we utilized one of these, um, and, you know, it helped EMT when they did meet up with us, but it also, uh, the, you know, the uh, organizer really appreciate it because it, it helps with their legal. And, and it's been uh, checked off to the ski patrol um, for uh, you know the legal legal information. You got to be careful to who you give this to because of the HIPAA laws. Um, so we, this is where we this is where we patrol. So you know a lot of these are local parks. There's one in Oakland County. There's another one in Oakland County. Bloomers, you know, Clinton River Park, Clinton River Trail. Um, so down you know all the way through. We do you know railroad trails, Macomb Orchard. Um, a lot of mountain biking, a lot of newer trails too, going up in, uh, in I'm not sure what county that is, but it's by, they're by Flint across 69. And, that, and that's the Cramba division partnering and assisting getting more mountain, mountain bike trails going. Uh, so what we do is, you know, we, we do everyday rides. So if you're, if you're riding, the expectation is, is you wear your jersey and you, you log it. And if anything happens, you keep track of it. Uh, we do organized group rides. This is a couple here. This is a massive fallout. Um, so this is what Prama puts on as an annual fund, fundraiser. Uh, and, and what they do is they hit like six of our parks and you got some hardcore riders doing that. This is the Mishka, Michigan Scholastic Cycling Association, but um, very, very well organized approach to uh, competitive mountain bike. Um, you know, and we're there in, in the actual course where we think there might be issues and you know, we're supporting the riders and getting them out, getting to the next level of care, which is our goal. Um, you know, it's a point challenge system that, that rotates through different courses. Uh, Blue Water Ramble, we got one coming, another one coming up in two weeks. Um, that's up in St. Clair. Um, so that, that's a, that's a, I don't remember what that cause is, but uh, this ride to end suicide is a very humbling day. And it's actually grown into two events. So what we do is, we support that event um, by riding in it, and uh, you know it's there for suicide suicide uh, awareness. Um, Turdy Trite, we partnered with them. You know they they uh, 
created a lot of the bike lanes in the city. Um, they were instrumental in getting that law passed for a three foot uh, where you can't pass a rider in a vehicle unless you give them three feet space. Um, but we've been supporting them for about six years. And uh, Zudamac, we just did that event. That's that starts at the zoo bar at uh, you know at Point Highlands and goes up to the Mackinac Bridge. Um, what we do, uh, we you know, we do a lot of training. This is Chris getting her certificate for for, for passing the outdoor first care course. Um, this is us practicing backboarding. Um, this is one of our instructors, Jeremy, uh, teaching something. Um, this is us uh, collecting bottles, assisting uh, another bike organization for something to, to generate revenue for them. And this is a trail day where we were, uh, I think this is the Pollyann Trail. I'm, I'm there somewhere, I think that's me there. But uh, you know, we're putting posts in the ground, helping them, they dig, and then we're in front labor. So you know, again, it's all volunteer. And it, if it makes it better, then, and you know we can uh, wear our brand and, and you know help sports community. Why not? So we also work with land managers. This is another trail that we're cutting in the river bends here. So this was all hand cut, and then a machine will come through and kind of grade it, and then uh, they bring in special clay. And, and you know it's a, it's a it's a science going down to make sure that uh, you know, the trails don't roll away in a couple of years. Um, so we also you know eyes and ears. On the course, we, we, we port down trees. If we can clear a hazard, we, we, put, we take it out. A lot of times there's vandalism on the on the course where you know these kids think it's funny to put sticks, sharpen them, and point them, point them towards the uphill, which you know is very dangerous. So we you know we, we're forever moving that stuff. Uh, so benefit to land land manager. Um, you know, the, the land management contracts are all managed by Cramba. So for us to patrol a piece of property, we actually enter into an agreement that clearly states that we're there to support and assist and we're not taking um, you know, ownership for the land, but uh, it's all legally you know, clear. Um, we report trail conditions, um, any hazards, we, we, can, we can clear them, we do. We do some maintenance, but we're not, we're not the employees of the landowner. Uh, Bike side uh, trail repair, mainly it's flats, but we can assist with you know chain repair. Uh, we don't really do brakes. I could loan you my tools and you can monkey with it, but um, from a liability standpoint, I don't want to take responsibility of the second failure on that brake. And then all of a sudden there's a lawsuit because uh, I'm not a brake technician, but uh, you know I can assist you. You know with the, with the flat tire, you, you know 99% of what we do for mechanical is a flat tire. If you have a flat and you're you're three miles away from getting out to your car, uh, you know, and then you, you, we can get you out. You know, they really, people really appreciate it. Uh, our first care, so, you know, we already talked about that. Uh, our standard of care, again, it's basic EMT, um, first year, uh, except for mobile. So, you know, when, <clears throat> when you're on a bike and you're injured and you're two miles in, um, it's amazing how many connector trails, logging roads, or or you know parallel roads you can you can get out and, and you know you use your cell phone and GPS and you can send nine one one the GPS coordinates and you know we just figure out how to get people out of the trails but um, you know we're there to get people to the next level of care uh, we're not allowed to dispense per the NSP any any type of uh, uh, medication so we can you know medic you know bug repellent uh, Saline solution to clean a wound, um, you know, anything like that, we can help. But uh, EpiPens, we're now allowed to, if somebody gets stung by a bee and they carry an EpiPen, we're allowed to, to, to administer it because it's, you get, we just got to make sure that it's registered to them. But uh, again, next level of care, that's our goal. So, you know, our bottom line is we, um, you know, we exist to really support the biking community, you know, by assisting, educating, and reforming. And, you know, there's 69 of us that uh, we're biking uh, enthusiasts, if you would. I mean, some guys are more hardcore than others, uh, but you know, you know the, the, I guess the description of our average patroller is it's, you know, I got some continental, I got some airline pilots and um, a lot of, there's a lot of people that are lawyers and then there's uh, myself, I'm retired. Um, so it's, uh, 
Oh, I'm trying to unshare my screen. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's that's us in a nutshell. So um, any questions? Yeah. Uh, th thanks, Vito. Uh, question here: Do you work or assist the LMB with their events? So uh, define who LMB is. I'm not sure. Uh, John, if you would unmute. So. <laughs> John Calvert, if you would unmute. Yeah, that's the League of Michigan Bicyclists. Thank they, you. They have the events like uh, this year they're doing <clears throat> the Michigander through our area. And um, they do a couple other events around the state. Uh, I, don't, so I, 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 I don't know like if anybody's approached you yet. If you, want, if you want to give them my contact information. Okay, great. Thank you. You, you want to take my cell or, or can, can you send it out, Kristen? Yep, yep, I can follow up with that and connect you both. Okay. So actually, you know what? That flyer that you were emailed has my contact information in it. Okay, there's no other questions in the chat, but I do have another, uh, one last question. If, if someone was interested in becoming a patrol member for Cranbo, how would they go about, would they contact contact you uh yeah so so uh pretty much um that flyer if you if you look in the back um, there's also a qr code that takes you to where you get even more answers but um you know it it, it talks about the costs associated with i mean that's the biggest hold up is, is this is all volunteer and sometimes people don't like to spend money for volunteer mm -hmm. uh, so uh you know that but you know, my number's on there. Um, there's a link to um, another email that I maintain. It's, you know, it's patrol director at cranba.org. But um, yeah, the best bet is to hit that, you know, come to me and then I'll start a conversation via email and just, you know, it's usually three or four questions back and forth and then uh -huh. try to schedule um, when we can get that person. If, if, they're a, if they're a current ski patroller in another area that I just don't know, um, then the onboarding is really pretty simple because the accreditation is managed by the local hill but if we have to take them from from no medical into the patrol um of the 69 members that we have i want to say like 32 are non-ski patrollers that we brought in trained put on a cpr course for them um but you know the goal is to have when we do those is they have three four five people go through it once so that we're not doing you know, a 12 hour course for everyone. Uh -huh. okay. But yeah, we're, we're always looking